Um, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we're, we're packed. We got a packed mezzanine as well. And uh, even though I can't see you, I know you can see me on those TVs. I love you. Which, wherever camera I'm looking at, I love y'all. Thank you so much uh, for coming to church today and uh, being where you can be because of your insatiable hunger to be in the presence of God and around the people of God. And we appreciate your hunger. We bless your hunger. We say thank you for being a part of our community. We are in what we are calling a re-season. Uh, this is something that has been, for Allison and I, at the forefront of our hearts for a while. And we have been feeling for the past number of months that there was some things that we needed to refresh. Um, you know what I'm talking about when you're on social media and you just like, you refresh the browser. Um, just in prayer and in conversation, we have said to one another, we need a refresh. Like, for where we're going, I feel like God's taking us into some unexplored territory. And before we get there, before we embark upon that journey, we need to refresh. We need to reset. We need to recover. We need to get ready because what is on its way is spectacular. And we want to be ready for it so that as we move forward, there's not one person that belongs to this family that is lost. Now, I've been praying that prayer in John chapter 17 where Jesus says, there's not one that you gave me, Father, that I lost. And, and this season is intended to be marked by health. It's intended to be marked by family and community and by prioritizing the right things. Those being the things that the Bible reveals to us and the things that the Spirit reveals to us by prayer. So in this re-season, we're just focusing on getting the family all together. We're not necessarily trying to build a ton uh, on the forefront, but we're taking a moment to reset and recalculate everything really about what we're doing as we enter into our eighth year as a local church. So if you missed the announcement, we're going to be having in September, the first weekend of September, details to come, we're going to be having a vision weekend. And if we can't do it here, I guess we'll do it elsewhere. But we're going to be having a vision weekend where on Friday evening, we're going to celebrate everything that Jesus has built over the last seven years of us being a church. And we're going to celebrate moving into our eighth year. And if you know anything about like biblical numbers or prophetic numbers, eight is simply a number of new beginnings. And this is going to be a time of new beginnings for our house. So we're going to have a big birthday party. It's also going to be my 40th birthday party. So if you were like, I hope some of you were just shocked. Like you were like, what? I didn't think you were a day over 30. Like I hope some of you are like angry right now. You're like, a righteous anger has overtaken you. I need somebody to throw a shoe right now. I can't believe it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I was preaching in California recently and... and um, I said, I have three kids. And it was funny because the room was like, what? Three kids. I was like, wow. Like, you guys are angry because I have three kids. It's weird. And they're like, we thought you were younger. And I'm like, how old do you think I am? People started yelling, 27, 28. I'm like, I'm moving here. <laughs> you know, like, this is amazing. I turned 40. So we're going to have a big birthday party. I'd love for you to be a part of my birthday party. It'd be awesome. So even if you don't come for a church conference, you can come for your pastor. Because I, I know some of y'all, you're like, man, you know, like, I, I get a conference every Sunday. I don't need to go to a conference. But you could just come because you love me. I don't know. It's just an idea. I appreciate that, Zenon. No gifts required. Just want you to be blessed with an encounter from the Holy Spirit as we celebrate our eighth year. And then on Saturday, we're going to do like a church brunch. All of the girls in here should have just went nuts because I'm going to have, it's part of my 40th. Listen, it's my birthday weekend. I can do what I want. I'm going to have the most basic white girl brunch you ever been a part of. All right. So just get ready. going to be virgin mimosas. It's just orange juice, but it's going to be served. It's going to be served with uh, 
in a nice little glass, you know. What is that? It's orange juice. It's going to be pumpkin spice lattes. I don't even care if it's the right season. It's going to be PSLs. Ben's volunteered to make them for us. <laughs> the confusion on his face as he said, amen, amen. We're, we're, we're just going to do whatever we can do to make it fun and special. And then all, on Saturday, when we, we're really going to do a brunch, though. Like, we're just going to go line upon line, and we're going to break down the future of our church, what we see, what we feel like God's revealing to us, the culture that we're a part of, the mission that we're pursuing, the vision that we feel that the Lord has given us. And we're going to spend that weekend doing that. So in between... Uh, time right now we're in the re-season we're in the refreshing season so for right now we're doing two services and uh, I don't know about you but it, it's kind of fun to see people I haven't seen in church in a while because we're doing two services some of y'all are like I could care less I don't like the parking and we know um, we're gonna do our best to do everything we can to serve you and serve you well but that is the season that we are in it is a season of Re. So look at your neighbors. Say, be refreshed. And open your Bible to Joshua chapter 3. Here we go. Joshua chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1 through 6 from Joshua chapter 3. This passage that I'm going to read to you today, I would honestly enjoy doing an entire sermon series from these six verses verses of scripture because they are so good but Joshua chapter 3 verse 1 through 6 when you found it please stand to your feet for the reading of the word of God we're going to read out loud all together as one big family and look at this I've even given you the pronunciation of the village so that you don't accidentally cuss all right I want you cussing in the house of God all right so ain't nobody gonna mess it up I helped you out, all right? Because if you hear somebody next to you cuss, you're going to be like, hey, hey, what's the house of God? <laughs> yeah, I'm here for you. Verse 1, then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shatim. That, that's how you say that. It's fancy. It's like you got that virgin mimosa right now. <laughs> Where you been? Shatine. It's fancy. And they came to the Jordan, he and the people of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. See, I feel like that's kind of the season that we're in. We're, we're right there at the Jordan. We're kind of preparing for what's next. And we're lodging there before we pass over. Verse 2 says, and at the end of three days the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people as soon as you the yeah uh, your God being carried by the Levitical priest then you shall set out from your place and follow it yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go. Now, you got to catch that right there. In order that you may know the way that you should go. All right? In order that you may know the way that you shall go. For you have... Ooh. Where we're going, we ain't never been before. You heard it last year. We've done all we can do in the form that we're in. We're going to new places. Look at your neighbor. Say, you're going to new places. So here's how you get ready to go into new places. Verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, For the Lord. I could shout right there. For tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders among you. I'm going to take that for myself. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 6, and Joshua said to the priest, take up and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went on before the people. The title of the message today is this, to get there, follow the Ark. To get there, follow the 
the ark. Lord, we thank you for the ark. We know who the ark is now. We know it's you, Lord Jesus. We know it's only by your word do we have direction. It's only by your presence do we have comfort. As we journey forward, as you call us into the more that you have for us, Lord, we know no ear has heard, no eye has seen what you've prepared for us. And we want to say as your kids, God, we are excited and we are expectant. Today, we turn up our faith. And if it's possible, Lord, I ask that you would set the temperature of our faith to the same setting as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I pray that we would have the same gift of faith as Christ Jesus does in this very moment in the heavenlies. I want Holy Ghost heavenly faith to fill our house. God, we thank you for doing it in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Give somebody a high five. Say, follow the ark. Follow the ark. Follow the ark. All right, let's, um, as I give you a, a title to get there, follow the ark. Let me try my best to define a few terms. As it pertains to our church family, when I say to get there, we don't know entirely where there is, but we do know that we have received a mission from the Bible and a prophetic vision from the Holy Spirit, which I think every church needs. We need a biblical mission and we need a prophetic vision. We don't really get to make up our mission around here. You guys do know that, right? We receive our mission from Scripture, and it starts with a mission called the Great Commission. So we've got a biblical mission, but we also want to receive a prophetic vision. Because God does unique things through different houses, and we are actively pursuing the Holy Spirit, asking for a refresh of downloads from him about what we are to be actively building in this season. One of those things we know is a new facility. <laughs> Everybody in here is like, yeah, we know. We know you need that new facility. We know. Uh, one of those things that we need is a new parking lot. And ain't much we can do, you know, with what we have. But uh, we know that there are some things that we can look at and say, that is what there looks like. So how are we going to get there? Now, for you as an individual, uh, you may be looking at some things in your life saying, I've got prophetic words. I've got promises over my life. God has spoken to me through the word and through prayer, and I know where there is. Some of you may be in here today saying to yourself, well, I don't really know where there is, but I do want to hear what you have to say about the ark. Because if you don't have a destination in mind, and even if you do, you've got to start with the person of Jesus, the word of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the ark is. The ark is not only the presence of God, but it is holy because it contains the word of God. All right, one of the things that uh, the ark is called, aside from the ark of the covenant, is the ark of the testimony. Why is that? Because it contains the very word of God. The Ten Commandments were in the ark, right? It was symbolic of the presence of God. It, 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 it was where God chose uh, to sit down. And it was a place that no matter where it went, carried with it the very presence of God. The ark was not magical. The ark was holy. So we have to remember, for all the charismatics in here, that it was called the Ark of the Testimony because the Word of God was in it, all right? We don't want to just look to the Spirit and completely ignore the Word, but if you're a real Bible-based, Reform-type person in here today, I want you to know that it was about more than just the testimony. It was also the very Spirit of God, the person of God that chose to sit down upon this box of acacia wood, not because it was magical, but because it was holy. And that's why you had to care for it with a certain measure of reverence. You ask the two guys that tried to steady the presence with their own hands in the flesh. What happened? They dropped dead. The Ark of the Covenant, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, is, it's expected that we have a reverence for how we approach those two things. It's expected that we would have a reverence in how we approach the Word of God. 
It's expected that we would have a reverence in how we approach the presence of God here and in prayer at home. Like it is expected that the people of God have a fear of the Lord, a respect. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Joshua said, I want you to keep 2,000 cubits between the ark and you. I don't want you to treat the presence of God as ordinary. I don't want you to treat the word of God as though it is normal. No, it's supernatural. It's sacred. It's special. It's our lifeline. It's how we navigate life. Wherever there is for you, I know how you're going to get there. And that is by following this and following the spirit of the Lord. I know for our church a little bit about where there is. And I don't know everything that we'll get to do, but I do know how we're going to get there. It's by following this and by following the Spirit of the Lord. To get there, follow the ark. That's why the leaders were told, as soon as you see the ark, Israel didn't move until the presence of God moved them. The people of God, they did not set out to do anything until the word of God moved them. Them. If you are going to follow the presence of God, if you are going to follow the word of God, you're going to have to become well acquainted with movement. I want to be a part of a movement, but you don't want to move. Explain to me how that works. I want to change people's lives, but you don't want to change. <laughs> Explain to me how that works. I want to change a city. But you never want your church to change anything. I'm done. Um, I'm just kidding. You with me? We've got to be ready to follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the lamb wherever it is that he would go. Growing up in Kentucky, we used to talk about wild goose chases. You know, and I know the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus, but it's more like following a wild goose. That's what we used to say in Kentucky following the Holy Spirit, you know. Jesus is a pretty agile fella. As soon as you think you've got him nailed down, he's like, all right, we moving. <laughs> Why? Because he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, not a domesticated house cat. And, you know, I, I appreciate all the effort to try to domesticate him, to put him in your living room and look at my Lord. Isn't he cute? Saturday, he needs to go in the box. Oh, man. Okay, let me just start this over. This ain't going so well. Let me start over. God does what he wants, when he wants. He's sovereign. Sovereign. Our job is not to tell God what we want done. Our job is to listen and, re and to respond to what God wants to do. Church is not a self-help program. It's not a self-development event. I'm cool with Tony Robbins, but this ain't unleashed the power within. <laughs> Lord, here's my list of demands. What, you got him hostage? Like, I don't know. What's happening? Here, here's, here's everything I want you to bless. You know what we, what we need to do, church, is we need to pray and ask the Lord, God, what are you blessing? Because that's what I want to get involved in. It's not that I'm always asking you to bless my stuff. I want to get involved in what you're doing because I know it's already blessed. God is not a part of your life. You are a part of his. I, I mean, I just, I, I love to remind us of this. Like, you did not get saved because you gave your life to God. You got saved because he gave his life to you. We need to remember this. It's, it's not a self-help event. It's not like, hey, Jesus, you're invited. You can sort of enhance my life when I decide to let you in. No, we are a people that is following the ark we don't determine where our boundary lines fall. Our boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places, but it's not because we've drawn them up. It's because he sits us there and says, here's the place that I have for you. Here's the inheritance. Sure, we have agency. Yes, we can tell him what it is that we desire, but at the end of the day, he does not exist for our pleasure. 
We exist for his. So what is next? Where are we going? I, I, I don't know every detail of where we're headed. I kind of feel like Abraham right now. You remember whenever he was like, you know, he's like, he's in the Ur of the Chaldeans. I don't know. I think he's involved in some, like, I don't know. Didn't his dad like sell idols or something? I can't remember exactly all of the details, but maybe he was working with his pops. Abraham. Leave your family and everything that you are familiar with and embark upon a journey. Where are we going, God? There. <laughs> Where is there? I'm going to give you a GPS, a God positioning system. Like you just follow me. Where? There. And this is why we call Abraham the father of faith, by the way. Because he risked everything on God and said, I'll follow the voice. I'll follow the ark. I'll follow the word. I'll follow the presence. And I, I want you to know, if you are new here, that is the people that you are a part of now. Like, that's our family. Like, we, we value stability. We, we value strength. We, we, we value strong foundations and proper formation. We value all of those things. But I want you to know that we really value the movement of the Holy Spirit, and we want to be wherever he wants us to be. We don't care where that is. Maybe that's the Middle East. Case in point, great, go in the name of the Lord. Go. It's not about being erratic. It's about being biblical. It's not about being spontaneous. It's about being obedient. That's it. At the end of the day, that's all it is. We are a people that follow the ark. Tell your neighbor, say, follow the ark. So in order for us to get there, here's point one. Expectantly look for the presence of God, all right? If you've dropped this off of your priority list recently, can I encourage you to bump it back to the top? Look for the presence of God in your life. I've been praying that God would make us like the tribe of Issachar, that we would understand prophetically the times and the seasons, and we would know what, says, Israel ought to do. What we, we would know what our church ought to do because we're dialed in to the word of the Lord and the presence of God. To get there, expectantly look for the presence of God. It's important. Pay close attention. Have expectation. You are expecting God to speak to you. You are expecting God to move before your eyes. I want to see God do something. Anybody else in here? That's what we are looking for. Well, if you have not felt it in a while for yourself, can I encourage you? Look for presence people in your life that are identifying what God is doing and what God is saying and follow them for a time. A safe place to start is in your local church. For me, I always know like when God is moving me in a particular direction because it's always accompanied with brokenness. Now, that's just me. You know, maybe God speaks to you in a particular way. But I know when God gets ready to move me into a new season, it will always be preceded by puddles of snot. That's me. When I'm broken before the Lord at the altar, God, all I need is your word. That's when I know I'm ready to be moved. God, I don't know what it looks like, but I don't care as long as you're there. That's, that's when I know it, it's time to move. It's just like Moses in the book of Exodus when he says, if your presence does not go with us, then don't send us up from here. It's going to stay in park till we get a word. Can I encourage you personally? Keep it in park until you get a word because Israel lost every battle that they did not pray through. When, when, when they sent them out, before they received a word, what happened? They lost. So being a presence person, being somebody who has a value for the word of God, you want to have that presence of a word in your life so that as you are called to step out, you can do so fearlessly. Knowing that, hey, God didn't promise me my safety, but he did promise me his presence. I ain't got time to go into that. But, but, but I, I do totally realize that a lot of people truly believe that, you know, getting involved with God is like gracefully falling into a Thomas Kincaid painting. And I, I appreciate the imagery, but it's just not true. 
Some of you are like, who's Thomas Kincaid? I don't know. Just do an AI thing. Like, you'll come up with different things. It's very cozy. I think it might come from the shack. Like, everybody just expects, like, when you get involved with God, you're going to find yourself in a cozy cottage next to a pond with the Father. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their cozy cottage was a fiery furnace. <laughs> Why didn't they burn up? Because the fire on the inside of them was hotter than the fire around them. Oh, what about Abraham? We just talked about him. What about Elijah? Gets involved with God, and all of a sudden, he's faced with this demonic queen named Jezebel and 400 prophets of Baal. I don't know about you, that didn't seem very comfortable. David, sprinting, 12-foot Goliath of Gath. Cozy cottage much? I don't know. I don't see it. Go through, look at all the prophets. Look at Isaiah. Look at Hosea. Go into the New Testament. Look at John the Baptist. All these paintings we see of him, he's like 50. He was martyred at 30. Paul, stoned. Not weed, but <laughs> rocks. Just want, you got to be clear in East Nashville now. Like, people are like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm cool with Paul. <laughs> no, nah, bruh, <laughs> different kind of stoning. <laughs> Persecution. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, bruh. Stop. I don't know, about, if I ever saw Paul's name on a ship's manifest, I ain't going to board. If he's on Disney Cruise, I'm out. Three ships sank. You, you couldn't say comfortable, right? You look at Jesus. We call ourselves Christians, and yet we resist the way of the cross. I, listen, I used to preach to every single young person that would listen to me, you're called to be a world changer. History is supposed to be different because you're alive. You will shake nations because of your yes. Go and do like you're going to be great. I would quote Winston Churchill and always say, history will be kind to you for you will write it. And you know what? I still believe that. But I refuse to preach that message today without also preaching the other side of the coin, which is if you want to change the world to a biblical proportion, then you're going to have to reconcile within yourself that your end might be biblical, meaning you might be martyred. This is too serious for a Sunday, I think. But it's important for our family to be reminded of this. This is, what, this is why he says, lay down your life. Pick up your cross and follow me. We wear crosses today because they're very beautiful. It's like a, you know, a nice piece of jewelry. Rappers got like two Jesus pieces. <laughs> but if you were wearing this in first century Israel, this would be the same as you wearing an electric chair today. We doing all right? All right, we'll keep going because I got to get back to my notes here. But I just think it's so important. If you don't think risk is going to be involved in us following the ark, we need a... Oh, I, but I, I thought my Christianity was all about Jesus being an enhancement. You need a refresh, man. And you know, honestly, you don't even need to go here. But you got to turn it to the side. You, you need a refresh. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm out of pocket. But does it, does it break anybody else's heart when you read this and then you sort of juxtapose our lifestyle to that of those that wrote it? And does it, does it break your heart? How, how, how did they become the apostles, this tribe of believers following Christ, the resurrected Lord and Savior, to such an extent that people declared when they came to their regions, these are those that have turned the world upside down with no frequent flyer programs and no TikTok, no MailChimp newsletter list, none of that. We're able to do that. Why? Because they were following the ark. 
They're following the ark. And if you don't know what it looks like for you in this season, can I encourage you? Look for some priests in your life, people who are carrying the presence, people who are carrying the word of God. And I am not talking about carrying virality or popularity or a lot of followers or any of that. Whenever you look at people who are carrying presence, you've got to look beyond power. Because there's some people who operate in supernatural power that I would not know if they are carrying presence at all. Why is that? Because they're not walking in holiness. And one of the things you have to remember about the Ark of the Covenant, it was not magical, it was holy. It was holy, all right? So when we're looking at priests, looking for a word, looking for him, we're not measuring their leadership on the basis of their virality, we are looking at, we're looking for holiness. So that's why the people of God could look at the leaders and say, okay, I can follow. So that's point two, to get there, look for leadership from people who carry the word of God in the presence of God. Because as Joshua uh, spoke, all right, let's go. Let's follow the ark. Let's go. That's exactly what I was referring to a moment ago. We are following presence. We're following the word. We're following presence people. We are looking to do more than simply a good job. We want to follow God. It's not just about doing good. When I was a missionary, I would meet people all the time in India and Africa, and they had a term for us, and and we were do-gooders. They say, oh, you, you guys out here doing good. Thank you for doing good. And I would always ask, like, what do you mean by good? I would ask the missionaries the same thing. I, I know the Bames, we're, 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 uh, we're on team Jesus in this sense. Uh, but as I, as, as I would meet missionaries out in the field, and they'd be like, oh, I came out here to do good. Don't just do good. Do what God's asked you to do. From the word. Following presence. And if you're going to do what God's asked you to do, you've got to seek to minister to people beyond their flesh. We're, we're going to feed people out here, but we got to feed them more than rice and beans. We got to feed them the word of God. We got to introduce them to the presence of God and reveal to them what their soul is actually looking for to be satisfied beyond breakfast. We're not, we're not just trying to do good in the city of Nashville. We're not just trying to do good in East Nashville. We're trying to follow God and be obedient to his word. Amen. And he says, hey, but create a little distance. Now, this was not only because the ark was dangerous, but because the ark was supposed to go first. Give the ark leadership, give presence leadership, give the word of God leadership. And that's point three, to get, the, to get there, give the word of God and the presence of God leadership in your life. So before you set out this summer to do whatever it is God's called you to do in this season of your life, can I encourage you process in the presence and ask the Holy Spirit what direction you are to go and how you are supposed to go and give the presence of God and the word of God preeminence in your life. That will ensure that when you land there, you don't get evicted. I I, I want to encourage you, if you have to continually violate peace to get it, it's probably not God. Yeah, who who am I talking to this afternoon? Well, you're trying to convince yourself that he is a good man. You don't need a good man, you need a godly man. Who am I talking to? Like, ah, you know, I kind of feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me I should not talk to her, but I can't help myself. I keep sliding in her DMs. Man, it got quiet fast. If you have to continually violate your peace to get it, it might not be God. I'd say it this way, probably not God. Oh, we got we to gotta buy this house. We got to buy this property. We got to do this. We gotta, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose. No, don't let fear run your life and anxiety make your decisions for you. Allow the word of God and the presence of God and the peace that surpasses all understanding to be the thing that you follow. We're different. That's what Moses said. Look, what distinguishes us from the rest of the people on the face of the earth, it's you. It's your presence. So that's number four, to not get lost. Make the word of God and the presence of God your number one priority. That ensures that you don't get lost. Whenever you commit to the presence of God and to the word of God in your life, here's what you do, church. You commit your life to the right path. 
You're not guessing, is this, is this what I need to do? Is that what I need to do? Go back to the word, go back to a place of prayer and receive your clarity. Anytime I deprive myself of prayer and the word, the byproduct is always confusion. Anybody else in here? What do I do? Where do I go? You get back to the word, you get back to the prayer, clarity comes. So quickly, right? I know as, as we do LSM and as I talk to young people, it's funny to me uh, looking through the lens of scripture, how we get so anxious about things that the Bible never directly addresses. The big, the big three today is where am I gonna live, what am I gonna do, and who am I gonna marry? I don't know about you, but I wish the Bible just explicitly told me where to live, what to do, and who to marry. Anybody else in here? That'd be awesome. But it's our immaturity that makes us uncomfortable with agency. God, just tell me what to do. I just want you to tell me. But what you don't realize is you're growing up in the spirit and he's saying, okay, hey, I trust you. Make a good decision. Base it on the word. Hear from me in prayer and make a great decision. He doesn't tell us in the scripture where to live because in the Bible, you were told where to live by your own parents. You, you, he doesn't tell us what to do as a career because in Bible times, you were told what to do as your work by your own parents. And, and it doesn't tell you ex ex exclusively who to marry because in biblical times, you were also told who to marry by your parents. I'm hoping we could bring that one back for my own kids now that I've got three. <laughs> Selfishly. Like, it would cause me a lot less trouble if you'd just marry my best friend's son, all right? Because I know him. And I'll whoop him. All right, here's point five. To get there and stay there, become completely dependent upon the word of God and the presence of God. You may not always feel prepared to step into new territory, but you can always be dependent. Let me say that again. You may not always feel prepared, but you can always be dependent. Let dependency be your secret sauce when it comes to promotions that God brings you into. God will always put you in places that you are not prepared to step into. To see, are you gonna depend on your own strength or are you gonna be dependent upon the Holy Spirit? He's the teacher, he's the helper. Trust him who got you there to keep you there. I, I have been invited into places, I have been so nervous. It's embarrassing to admit, even in the last six months, some of the places I've been invited to go, I've been so nervous to talk there. Like truly, like, um, and this is like, you know, just a, a ministry thing, but I think it applies to work and to other places. Uh, and I can tell you, like I was doing a QA, and a and every single question that was asked to me, I had no idea what to say. You know, that imposter syndrome where you're like, they're gonna figure out. I, they're going to figure out, God. I'm from West Kentucky. <laughs> you know, you start looking at all the reasons why you shouldn't be there and start trying to convince God to demote you because of your, how uncomfortable you are. Like, what, God? I should not be in this room. And the Holy Spirit always reminds me, you may not feel prepared, but you can be dependent. Just choose to be dependent. God, I, I put all of my hope in you. I put all my trust in you. I don't know what to say, but I know you've got something to say. And if I'm here, it means because you put me here. I'm following the ark. I'm following the presence. I'm following the word. Number six, to get there and to go further, keep clean hands and a pure heart by being consistently washed in the word of God and the presence of God. I'm not saying you can't get promoted and be impure. But, but I do think that our purity, the, 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 the level at which we will allow the Holy Spirit to purify our hands and purify our heart to a certain extent will determine how promoted we can actually be. Because God wants to bring you into new places. But are we willing to allow the word and the presence to purify our hands and purify our motives so much so that when we get in that place, he can continue to trust us with his spirit? Did that make any sense to anybody?
I, I really believe it's important, church. I really believe it's important. For a long time, I always told people, if you want to get promoted, if you want to walk in power, if you want to be anointed, all you've got to do is pray fast and read the Bible. You just got to be Jesus in the wilderness. You got to get out there and pray and fast. But you know, there was something else that Jesus did that we often look over, and that is he resisted temptation. I really believe this, church. We will be as anointed as we are willing to resist temptation. We got to be tenacious about resisting temptation. We're following the ark. Therefore, we want what the ark has to be upon us. We want to be holy people. I, I, want, I want to see the power that resurrects the dead. Romans talks about that it's the spirit of holiness that resurrected Christ Jesus. And I don't know, there's just something about that that just moves me on the inside. I'm like, Lord, what does it take? I want to see biblical miracles. I want to see biblical salvations. I want to see biblical baptisms. I want to see biblical harvest. I want to see biblical revival. Anybody else in here? What is it going to take? What will it take? That's the question that I'm asking myself. I'm willing to follow the ark, but I feel like the Lord's extending an invitation, but are you willing to make whatever change is necessary to stay close to the ark? Because I hear what you're saying, but when I start moving, I start asking you to let go of a couple of things. I start asking you and inviting you into a position of repentance. So, you know, will you let go of everything that brought you here to get you there? Are you willing to drop your nets? Matthew chapter 4, Jesus calls out to the disciples. They dropped their nets. They followed him. You know, I know they were fishing nets, but I like to call them today safety nets. Whatever your plan B is, if this whole following Jesus thing don't work out, are you willing to let those say, no, God, whatever it takes, whatever it looks like, I don't care. Whatever it means, I don't care. I, I want to be a presence person. I, I not only want to receive from your presence, but I want to I want to share presence. I want to impart from your presence. I, want to, I don't just want to receive a word. I want to share a word. I, I may have missed the number, but this is the last point. I'm purposed to carry the presence of God into the world. You're purposed to carry the presence of God into the world. You be an ark. You be an ark. I got people in my life that are like arks. What about you? They carry the presence of God that you're like, I'm going to stay 2,000 cubits away from you. Because <laughs> you're so holy, you're scaring me. You know what I'm talking about. Those people you see, you don't look in the eye. You're like, man, don't read my mail, bro. I, 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 rem I remember, you know, just being in rooms with people I would consider to be heroes. And, and, and just witnessing the atmosphere that they would carry as they walked in and it wasn't about what they said it, it was it was just about the presence that they walked in the word that they carried the spirit of God that was on their life that's who we are church in this re-season you're going to hear several messages that I've shared before and the purpose of it is to remind us of the DNA code that the Holy Ghost has put together in our blood and this is who we are. We're presence people. We have a desire to be before the Lord, to not quench the Holy Spirit, to not grieve the Holy Spirit, but to be swiftly obedient to the Holy Spirit because everything that God has in store for us, we want it all. How about you? I want it all. I want everything. Everything that belongs to us as a result of this New Testament. I want everything. Everything that's given to us as a result of the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I want to witness it with you. Anybody else in here? I want to pray that the Lord would rescue us from a boring life. From a boring Christianity. I want to pray that the Lord would rescue us from consumerism in the church. I want to, re I want to pray that the Lord would just would rescue us from church as usual I, I want to pray that the Lord would rescue us from faith as usual just going through the motions I know that may seem like a scary prayer for some of us because it'll jostle us a little bit and pull us out of our comfort zones but your calling is not your comfort your calling is Jesus amen
Father, I pray right now for each and every one of us, for our house, for the culture of this house, for the direction of our church, that we would not give up on following the ark. Because we know the ark is going to bring us into so many blessings. Just like at Obed-Edom's house. When the ark was there, blessings came. And, and I don't want the ark to move and be looking at the blessings. Yeah, it was great, man. What a season. Man, that was awesome. Can you believe that God did that in our midst? Man, that was great. The ark is gone now, but we got all this stuff. Lord, forgive us. I pray in Jesus' name that you would forgive us as we repent today for focusing on anything except for you and the words that flow from your lips and the spirit of God that you've given us without measure. God, we want... We want you, Holy Spirit. We want you, Holy Spirit. We want to make it clear to heaven that we want you, Holy Spirit. You are a person. You're not a vibe. You're not an energy. You are a person, and we want you here. We want you here. We want you here. We want you in our midst. We want to see the supernatural in our midst. We want to see healings of physical bodies in our midst. We want to see people resurrected from the dead in our ministry. We want to see marriages restored. We want to see addiction, uh, just a death blow dealt to addiction in our midst that people would be healed of dependency and drug addiction, God. We want to see that and we know you are able to do that. And so, Lord, we fixate upon you and we attach ourselves to your desires and we ask, God, that you would have your way in this house and that you would have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, move us to pray scary prayers, Lord, to not live routine, routine in, in church, God, but to go beyond that. I, I, I almost, it's, it's not really an altar call, but I just, I almost just want to ask, like, is there anybody else in the room that you're like, there's something in me where I've just got to have more than what is expected of routine, westernized consumerism, Christianity? Anybody else like, I just got to have more than that. I, it's probably why you came here, to be honest. And I, I really do believe, y'all, that what God is doing in our midst, it's, it's not unique to us as a church, but, but I, I, I do think it's unique to the extent that we welcome it and we say, yes, God, and we want it. We want what you want, and that's it. We're not going to give you an agenda. You give us an agenda. That's what we want. Are you in agreement, church? If so, just say, I agree. I agree. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to worship the Lord.